Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this year's Surface Design Symposium presented by Spoonflower and Craft Industry Alliance. My name is Jesse Katz Greenberg, and I'm the artist community manager here at Spoonflower. And I'm so excited to again be partnering with Abby and Craft Industry Alliance to bring you this event jam packed with information you can use to start or grow your surface design business. Welcome everyone. I'm Abby Glassenberg. I am the co-founder and president of Craft Industry Alliance, the trade association for the crafts industry. And I'm also very excited to be co-hosting the symposium with Jesse from Spoonflower. We have a truly fantastic series ready for you and I just can't wait to get started. Awesome. So let's share a little bit about Spoonflower and Craft Industry Alliance. So Spoonflower is a print-on-demand platform and manufacturer of wallpaper, fabric, and home decor. Our online global marketplace connects makers and consumers with independent artists all over the world who earn royalties every time their designs are purchased. Any artist can set up shop at spoonflower.com now to start growing their surface design business. And why don't you um, let us know in chat if you already have a Spoonflower shop. I'd love to see how many of our current artists are here. That would be great. And the Surface Design Symposium is co-produced by Craft Industry Alliance and Spoonflower. And Craft Industry Alliance is a community for creative professionals just like you. Get expert trainings like the ones that you're going to see today and tomorrow every single month. Plus, become part of a vibrant creative community for advice and support as you go. We have a special coupon code to share with you today. So for participants in today's session, you can use the code Surface Design 2023 and save 20% off your membership through October 13th. And that's at craftindustryalliance.org. Awesome. Thanks, Abby, for sharing that code. So some quick housekeeping before we begin. If you have questions during this session, please add them to the Q&A tool. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of us here and the chat is moving pretty fast. And we just wanna make sure that we don't miss any of your questions. And the best way to make sure we don't miss them is to just add them to that Q&A tool. And with that, I'm gonna head behind the scenes for most of this one and let Abby take it away. So enjoy the workshop, everyone. And I will see you in chat. And as we all know, Photoshop is a powerful program with the ability to preserve the textures of your hand-drawn, painted, and printed artwork. It provides endless options for editing your work, but where do you start? Because it's a pretty robust program as well. So I'm very excited to welcome Sarah Watts, who will help us understand Photoshop a little bit better today. So welcome, Sarah, and can you introduce yourself? Hello. Hi, everybody. What's <laughs> I am so excited that I get to start this party off. Um, thank you so much, Abby and Jesse, for having me this year. I am super pumped. Uh, as some of you might know, I am on a mission to get more artists familiar and comfortable with Photoshop. Um, I like to think of Photoshop as a dragon that you just have to train. And once you train it, you get to fly around and do these amazing adventures with your artwork. Um, <laughs> I see a lot of familiar faces in the chat. Hello, everyone. Some of you are in my From Paint to Pattern course and in my Sketchbook Squad course, which is super exciting. Um, so if you're new to my world, I am an artist, a surface designer, and I also teach online. I also design fabric for Ruby Star Society, and it is it's been an amazing life. I really, really love doing this. I have been working in Photoshop for about 21 years. I met my husband the same year I started using Photoshop. So I like to think that I'm married to both Photoshop and my husband. Um, <laughs> and I love this program so much. It is it is basically my favorite program in the entire universe of surface design. Um, a little bit about me, I went to Ringling, I got a BFA in illustration, and I ended up getting an interview at Carter's and Oshkosh, and all of my friends like to laugh that I got a job there because I was the, you know, the person that liked to listen to metal music and draw, like, spooky haunted houses and stuff, and then I ended up getting a job designing adorable baby clothes, 
and I'm pretty proud of it. Um, but I worked at Carter's and Oshkosh for two years, and I designed everything from, you know, uh, PJs to, uh, um, you know, the garments that you see little kids wear, like all those cool embroidery shirts and screen printed shirts. I worked on production. I worked on helping with uh, the line work. I helped do the tech work behind the scenes. I um, And then after working at Carter's, I just wanted a new adventure. So I started working at International Greetings. And there I learned how to do a lot of stuff um, for greeting cards and gift wrap. So I've designed stuff for like Target and Michaels and TJ Maxx and uh, worked on a lot of really big licenses through that company. And uh, at some point during my time there, and this is all in Atlanta, I, I live in Atlanta, or now I live a little bit outside of Atlanta. But uh, soon after working at IG, I got, um, I was in the surface design group in Atlanta. And one of my friends was like, hey, Blend Fabrics is hiring and they're starting this, uh, or, you know, Anna Griffin is starting this new division called Blend Fabrics. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want a fabric collection. I love sewing. Uh, and then I got um, an interview with Blend Fabrics and ended up landing my first uh, fabric collection. And I remember at that time, uh, any hand raised to any other millennials in the group that remember when everything was all about blogs and blogger and <laughs> all of that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, well, when I was just getting started, everything was on blogs. And I remember seeing like, you know, all of these different designers that I really admired uh, using spoon flower. And I learned about this whole like pattern design world. And I just became obsessed. I was already drawing patterns and everything in college, but I didn't realize that you could actually do that you know, for a living. And it was just like, whoa, I have got to do this. Um, so anyway, I got my first fabric job with Blend Fabrics, fell in love with the sewing and quilting industry. I just loved the collaboration and the community. And um, soon after that, I ended up wanting to just explore other company options. And Melody Miller uh, pitched the idea to RJR to do cotton and steel. And I ended up being one of the founding designers of Cotton and Steel Fabrics and worked there for a while. And then things didn't work out with our group. So we ended up taking the entire group over to Moda Fabrics and they took all of us on at the same time. And now we're Ruby Star Society. So that is my largest um, licensing job is designing sewing fabric for the quilting industry. And what I love about working with uh, Ruby Star Society is that I'm able to have a spoon flower shop. And so a lot of times you'll notice if you get fabric jobs, they won't let you kind of, you know, have a license and and with another, uh, you know, um, you know, fabric company, but uh, they were like, yeah, sure, have a spoon flower shop. And I was like, done. I've been wanting to have this for years and I haven't been able to. So very excited about that because I remember when I was in college, Spoonflower was one of those first inspirations in my kind of gateway into the fabric and surface design world. So very exciting. And um, yeah, Jesse just dropped my Spoonflower link. I need to update it a little bit, but it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, I want to show you a little bit of fabric. And I want to show you how to use Photoshop in one hour. Are y'all ready for this? <laughs> um, one of the things that I want to preface about Photoshop is that a lot of people feel a little bit like intimidated by it. And it's in the name, like it says Photoshop. You're like, oh, it's a photo editing program. Like why would an artist need that? But let me tell you, and all of my students can tell you this, that when you learn Photoshop, you open a huge amount of opportunity. There are so many companies looking for more textural artwork. Digital printing is becoming more and more available and that makes textured uh, artwork even easier to make. Now you can certainly screen print textural artwork, but you might be wondering, what the heck are you talking about, Sarah? What is textury artwork? And I just mean like, have you ever scanned in a watercolor piece and then wanted it to look exactly like that in a repeat pattern, right? What? You could do that. It's so awesome. Um, so you just need to learn Photoshop. And I think 
I'm a little biased, but I think you need to learn Photoshop from someone that's a little bit goofy because it can be a really intimidating program and I try my best to make it a little bit fun. <laughs> um, so anyway, Photoshop's my best friend and uh, what it does is it allows you to preserve the texture and the beautiful nuances and gradients that you'll see in like watercolor, acrylic, gouache. You can draw and procreate and bring it into Photoshop. And I know a lot of my students are like, well, why would I go from Procreate to Photoshop? And it's because Photoshop is way easier to make repeat patterns, to not lose the edges of your artwork when you're making repeats. It, it allows you to make mock-ups. It allows you to make, um, you can make edits on your social media photos. So like if your toddler jumps in the back of your photo while you're trying to take a picture of your new art print, you can Photoshop that out. It's pretty awesome. Um, so I just, I really feel passionate about this program and I feel strongly that people can learn it without, I just want to empower you. Like you're going to be able to do Photoshop stuff and you're going to be fine. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention, uh, Jesse just dropped the link. I teach a, this is hilarious that I'm teaching Photoshop in an hour because I have a 10 week long Photoshop course that is followed by a year long membership of Photoshop. But my year long Photoshop class is actually in session right now. Um, today, we just had the amazing Elizabeth Olwyn come and speak to our class. And we've got just, you know, amazing guest speakers that come and speak and do art demos. We have Kyle Webster, who makes all of the brushes for Photoshop, he's coming to do a demo for us. So this course is huge and uh, it opens again next August. So if you're interested in it, I would say, you know, start saving now or whatever you got to do. But that is my longer course that really, I mean, I'm holding your hand the whole way. We have 20 live Q and A's, like you're going to learn Photoshop thoroughly in that class. However, you get a replay of this session and you can watch it over and over again. And we're gonna get you up to speed on at least how to make a repeat pattern to upload to Spoonflower um, in this class, okay? And I'm gonna start hurrying up because I only have an hour. <laughs> okay, so first I wanted to real quick just show you, um, let's see, I, let's see, let me change my view, okay. I just want to show you uh, two pieces of fabric that uh, there's a common misconception that you can't print textured fabric. And I'm just like, no, 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 no. You just need the right manufacturer. You can definitely print textured fabric. Uh, so the first design I'm going to show you is the poppy print that I did. And I printed it on Spoonflower fabric, shipped super fast. The quality is beautiful. And it's a very textury, very large repeat pattern. So hold on one second. Let me grab it. Um, and I did this and I, I basically watercolored the flowers and then I, uh, finished everything in Photoshop. And if you look up close now, it's a little wrinkled. I got kids, you know, we throw things around in here. All of those very beautiful, subtle watercolor deliciousness textures are printed on this from Spoonflower. So I just, I'm so excited about this. I probably have it upside down. Uh, don't know what I'm gonna make yet, but it's gonna be cool, okay? Um, the other thing I love about Photoshop is you can take something, you can take a file from Illustrator, from Procreate, from Fresco, um, from Photoshop if you want. You can draw it right into Photoshop or you can bring in all of your watercolor pieces and all of that kind of stuff right into the program and leave it exactly how it is. It doesn't get, uh, you know, vectoring is amazing because you can rescale it and it's awesome, but sometimes you just want to keep that really subtle texture. So uh, now this I wanted to share with you because this is a screen printed texture print. Um, so this is where people are like, oh, you can't screen print textures. I'm like, yes, you can, you can. Um, so this is, the dolphins from Procreate, the um, the watercolor textures, I was just playing around one day and I just, this is a giant collage piece. So I did not draw a very intricate illustrated scene of dolphins, you know, floating through the abyss. 
I actually composed this whole thing in Photoshop. So if you're someone who doodles, but maybe you don't have a vision for like finished pieces in that moment, using a program that'll allow you to kind of pull things together and make mistakes and fix them, whatever you got to do, uh, you can totally do that. It's fine. Um, so anyway, here is my dolphin print. And if you get up close, you will see that there are some extremely subtle, beautiful gradients. And yeah, with screen printing, you just have to, they take each value of each color and they break it down into a few screens. So you might be limited on the overall palette, but you're able to like take a blue and knock it down to like four screens. And then you can get that beautiful gradient and you can't even tell that this is screen printed. It looks digital. So um, anyway, I wanted to show you that. Woo, throwing stuff. Um, okay, how's everybody doing? I love seeing the chat so lively. This is awesome. Yes. Stevie says, my issue is taking off the background from skin artwork. Oh, I I have five or six different ways that I do that. It's, it's totally doable. Um, everybody doing good? Feeling, feeling fine today? <laughs> All right, let's do this. Uh, someone asked who screen printed that. That was Ruby Star Society, um, the, the fabric company that I designed for. Um, that got printed through my collection, Florida Volume 2. All right. Yeah, cleaning up edges and all that stuff, super easy. Uh, okay, so, I mean, I'm not saying it's super easy at first, but you just practice it a little bit and then you get the hang of it. It's like riding a bike or swimming. Like eventually you just, it feels second nature. Uh, let's jump into Photoshop. Are y'all ready? Yes. All right. Share my screen with you. I'm a horrible singer, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> my, stu my students are like, oh my gosh, there she goes. All right. So real quick, um, I just wanted to show you the files it took to make the dolphin piece. So this is a drawing I did in Procreate. Uh, this is an ink drawing. Ink drawing. Oh, no, this one's from Photoshop. And then these are like watercolor pieces. And then I removed the background, separated each motif, and then I collaged them together to create the dolphin file. So um, each color is separated into screens. And then when it goes to the mill, they separate it even farther based on what they need for their, um, for their production, right? So you can see if you turn off all these layers that each individual color has been uh, separated in order to get that screen printed effect. And like I said, some of them, they had to split it into a few more screens. Okay, so I wanted to show you the dolphin file, but now I'm gonna walk you through Photoshop. And listen, some of you are like, I already know Photoshop, and that is awesome. So apologies if this feels a little bit repetitive to you. Um, I do have to approach this as if you've never opened it before. And because we only have an hour, I won't go through everything, but I am going to show you how to make a basic repeat. My favorite way, just the fastest way is, um, you know, using pattern preview. However, if you take my long format class, I teach you how to do it, uh, building it from the ground up, because I feel strongly that you need to know how a repeat works in order to troubleshoot it. So uh, pattern preview is great, but it is kind of a shortcut. So it's like, oh, awesome. I, you will be able to make a pattern in Photoshop after seeing this class using pattern preview. However, it's better to learn how to make one manually so that you can separate all the colors really easily and understand the inner workings of a repeat pattern so that if you ever have a client that's asking for revisions or scale changes or anything like that, you understand how to do it and you can make the changes so that you have more control over the design, okay? All right, let me open. I'm gonna start from the very beginning of a, um, I'm gonna show you how you can take a not so great scan and turn it into something really pretty. We only have an hour. All right, so desktop, here we go. 
There's my spoon flower folder. All right. Close. Close. Are y'all ready to rock and roll? I sure hope so. All uh, right. So when you first open Photoshop, you're probably like, oh my gosh, what is all this stuff? It's so confusing. Look, coming from me, I've been using this program for 21 years. I know all the ways around it. You don't need all this stuff. Okay. So you can learn everything and then just choose to use some of it. Right. Um, so when you open Photoshop, you'll kind of see something like this. And if you come up here to windows, uh, if you're wanting to follow along with this, then I would just say open the workspace and go to the essentials. That's a good place to start. And what they'll do is they'll be collapsing everything for you over here so that it's a little bit cleaner, especially if you're on like a laptop and you can easily collapse everything. And the other thing is I want you to think of this as like Ikea drag and drop uh, organizational systems where you can just put things where they go, right? And you can take this panel and sandwich it in between here. And whenever you see that little blue line pop up, that's saying, hey, do you want me to put this here for you? And you say, yes, thank you. And you just let go of it, right? So Photoshop is very, it, it, you can get it really organized. And I teach my students how to reset their space to be exactly what they need. So I want you to think of it as your art desk. And this is your program, you're in control of it, and you do not need to know every single thing about it in order to make some awesome stuff, okay? So just get that imposter syndrome kind of mentality out of your head. You are allowed to use this program and you can make awesome stuff, okay? There's your permission slip. Sometimes it just takes that, right? Um, so when you get in here, over here on the right, everything, you know, you see all this and you're like, whoa, patterns are like where you, you know, you can make pattern fills to make repeats. You've got gradients and swatches. And I teach my students how to just kind of take out all the stuff that they don't need to look at. It's okay to get rid of stuff and you can always bring it back later. But one of the things I want to do to remove the mystery of Photoshop for you is just to let you know that more often than not, they're just putting things in multiple places. Some people don't like to come up to the drop down to find something. So then you might see the same exact thing over here. And, you know, it just shows up in multiple places, but really it's more simple than it looks when you come into the program. Okay. Now, uh, what I like to do is make sure my brushes are out. So I'll go up to window and window is where you will bring up all of the panels on the right that you want to look at. So think of these panels on the right as like paint palettes and brushes and stuff like that that are sitting on your art desk. Okay. And then in the Photoshop screen over here, you're looking at the overhead view of a sandwich. Okay. You're like, what, Sarah, why a sandwich? But I want to show you what I mean by that real quick. Um, Photoshop works in layers. So if you've ever used Adobe Illustrator, you might realize that you can just grab and touch everything in the program. It's amazing, right? And Illustrator does have layers also, um, but you just don't use them as much. Um, but when you're using Photoshop, you're using layers very much. It's really, really cool to... Uh, you know, have layers because you can layer up artwork and really have control over every single piece of it. And let me open up my layers file. So if you look over here um, on the right, these, uh, these layers are, this is the side view of your delicious sandwich, okay? So think of this as the side view of your sandwich. And then over here on the artboard is the top view of your sandwich, okay? So you're looking at the top and then you're looking at the side, okay? So whatever is on the top of the side of your sandwich is going to be at the top view on your artboard. So here's the artboard and over here is the sandwich. Um, so this is like top piece of bread, right? And then notice how when I turn these little eyeballs will allow you to turn the layers off and on so that you can see them. So uh, if I turn the pink layer on, then that can be your, I don't know, tomato, sriracha, whatever you want. Uh, turn the red layer on, that should be the tomato for sure. 
Then you've got mustard <laughs> and pink could be some kind of meat or whatever. Yeah, it could totally be, a, I don't know, piece of cheese, whatever. So think of this like a sandwich and then your background is the bottom piece of bread, okay? Bottom piece of bread, top piece of bread, and then you can have as much stuff on your sandwich as you want. I mean, you can have folders of sandwich stuff in your sandwich, okay? Um, so anyway, layers are very important in Photoshop and you're gonna have to be touching the layer in order to move the thing, okay? So if you want to touch the top piece of the sandwich, maybe you wanna switch it out for a sourdough or something, you just move it around, but you have to be on that layer over here on the right in order to do that, okay? And once you get that, you're like, oh, hmm, all right, cool, we got it. And another thing, this is uh, this is Photoshop shortcuts, right? So I'm basically giving you a shortcut to making a pattern in this program and also giving you a quick lesson on how the whole thing works. But I do wanna show you one little cool thing that if you're used to being able to just grab things in Photoshop, anytime you're doing anything in Photoshop, I want you to look at this top bar. This top bar is your options bar. And it's basically like, if I've got one of these tools selected, it's gonna show me more things I can do with that tool. Like, whoa, right? Um, so this top tool is your arrow and that's what you need to grab things. And if you hit the um, command key on a Mac and anybody know the PC command for that, drop it in the chat. Um, but when you hit command, you'll notice this little auto select button. So if I wanna just not go over to my layer, layer panel over here and touch this yellow, I can see how it's toggling auto select up here in the top left. So by hitting command, I'm able to touch anything in here, okay? Which gives it that feeling of being an illustrator if that's what you want. So a lot of you probably have made patterns in there if you have made patterns. So that, that will feel a little more familiar. The other thing you can do is you can just check it and literally not have to hit any hotkey and it will let you touch anything. And notice on the right side, it's just going to whatever layer I'm touching, right? But I personally don't like to have this always selected. I like to hit command to toggle it because I end up having so many layers and folders and whatnot that I just like, ugh, okay. Um, so you know that you can move these little panels around. Think of these like little organizational boxes on top of your desk. And I wanna show you the, the layout that I have because it's easier for me to work with. So. This is the essentials layout, and I showed you how you can kind of drag and drop and move things around, but let's go up to window, uh, workspace. If you decide you really like a workspace and you're like, I am keeping this, it's the best, then you can go to new workspace. So it's under window, workspace, new workspace, okay? And that is where you would save your workspace so that you can load it over and over again. Now, right here is my current workspace that I use, and it's called the 2023 Official Workspace and Shortcuts. And I have all my keyboard shortcuts saved in there as well. Um, so this is what I'm used to looking at in Photoshop. You don't have to use this, but I just it's a little bit easier for me to kind of show you around if I can see everything. I like to have history open because you can go back in time visually. And the hot key to that is Command Z or Apple Z, you might hear uh, design nerds say either one. Um, so Command Z, you know, once you get used to doing Command Z, you're gonna be like driving and, you know, thinking, oh, I forgot something at home, Command Z. And then you're like, oh wait, I'm not in Photoshop, so I can't do that. Um, but Command Z will take you back. So notice how it's taking me back in the history panel, okay? And then option Command Z, no, 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 hold on. Which one is it? Is it shift command Z? Will take me forward. Shift command Z will take you back to where you were before. Okay. Um, so undo and redo are going to be your best friends. Okay. I'm telling you, you're going to need those. Now, the other thing you'll need is command plus and minus. So zoom in, zoom out. Now, this is what I love about digital painting. I am sitting here at my desk. And if I were doing this traditionally, I would need to take the piece of paper and kind of go like this or stand back in the room. But you're kind of imitating looking back at your work and uh, close to your work by hitting 
zoom in and zoom out. So those are very useful shortcuts. The last shortcut I wanna make sure you know is the space bar. The space bar allows you to pan across your artwork, okay? Pretty cool, right? Uh, one thing they added to Photoshop pretty recently that you, I'm gonna just tell you this one too, because it's so good, um, is the R tool or rotate. And you'll notice over here in the tools that that just made it to where, what, I can move my sheet of paper around on my desk and get those weird angles when I'm trying to paint something, like that's super cool, right? So that one's really useful. And if you want it to click back into space, you just do -do, double click it and it will bring you back, okay? All right, so I went over the panels on the right and up here, this stuff will probably look super overwhelming and you're like, whoa, but let's just go over a couple of them, okay? So file, save as, you're gonna need to know how to save a file, right? And if you're uploading to Spoonflower, then you'll probably just want um, a JPEG works great. And you'll you'll export the 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 tile that you create, and um, you'll make sure to make it three uh, one hundred and fifty DPI. Okay. So I teach all my students never print anything less than three hundred, unless you're putting it on Spoonflower. Now, when you print on fabric, fabric's a little more porous. So you can't see those tiny, tiny, tiny little differences between 150 and 300. So uh, Spoonflower takes 150 and it prints gorgeous. So generally speaking, you want to print everything at 300 DPI or more. Um, 300 is pretty standard. I don't think I'll ever hear anything else than that. But when you're uploading to Spoonflower, you'll want to make sure to change it to 150 if you want it at the scale that it's currently at, okay? So that's image size. And then if you're going to export, you would just go right here to resolution and change it to 150. If you're wondering what resolution is, um, I have a PDF guide called From Paint to Pixel. And uh, you'll sign up for my newsletter and then you'll get the download page to it. It's a pixel guide. It, it talks all about resolution, bringing your artwork into Photoshop, um, the difference between CMYK and RGB and why you would choose one over the other. Uh, it goes over different basic cleanup tools. It'll probably cover some of the stuff that's in this lesson. So um, I think that we can put that in the chat. And let's see. Yep. Okay. So uh, if Jesse can drop that in the chat, it's basically a. Um, 30 page guide that we have that's just packed full of information on what resolution is and that kind of stuff. But uh, basically it's pixel density. So how many pixels it takes to make up the image and 300 is the standard. Uh, I teach my students to scan in at double or triple the size. Like when you make artwork in Procreate or you scan it in, I would say scan it in at 600 or 900. And then when you bring it into a 300 DPI document, you have the ability to make things double the size or triple the size. So one of the common misconceptions about Photoshop is, oh, you can't make like small art big in Photoshop. You can, but what you can't do is scale it down and then later on scale it back up because we it can't invent pixels. It can't make up information. So there is a different process, like much like, you know, we're used to being able to scale up and down all day long in Adobe Illustrator because it's vector and you can do that, right? But the downside is that you have to vectorize your art. So if you've got a watercolor print, it's not gonna look like watercolor in the same way. Well, Photoshop's like, you know, caveat is that you need to scan things in uh, at the scale that you think you might use it at. So if you wanna make wall wallpaper, I would recommend scanning things in at 600 DPI or 900 DPI so that when you go to print at 300, you have twice or three times the size of that art and it just looks crisp and so good, okay? But like I said, in that PDF, there is more information on that and I go over it extensively in my From Paint to Pattern class because resolution, RAM, scratch disks and all that stuff are just like, it's kind of nerdy, but we get into it so that everybody feels extremely comfortable because you can totally do this. It's like, 
I mean, look, we're designers. We learn stuff. We know how to do this stuff. We're savvy. We're, you know, scrappy, whatever you want to call it. And you can totally figure out how to learn all of this nerd talk. Okay. Um, anyway, so like I said, 300 is the, like the baseline, but if you're uploading to Spoonflower, you'll just go right here and just change it to 150, but make a copy of your artwork before you do that. Cause you want the highest resolution of your artwork saved somewhere. Okay. All right. Now, uh, up here, I love using layer, um, let's see, image adjustments. The only things that I really touch in here when I'm first teaching my students is hue saturation. This is a great place to change color. And then I'll go into uh, vibrance is awesome. This will make your, your artwork more saturated without changing the hue. Um, this is a Photoshop specific um, tool. So you you know, if you're wanting to make something more saturated, but you don't want to change the hue, use Vibrance. This is a beautiful way to change, you know, make something feel more intense in color, right? Um, but like when you're in here and you're looking at all this stuff and you feel overwhelmed and you're like, ah, you don't need all of it. Just pick the things that work for your process. And at first, I would say you need image adjustments and you need to be able to use hue saturation, okay? Uh, and you need to know vibrance is cool, brightness and contrast, all the things you're used to doing on your phone, editing photos for like Instagram or whatever. Those are very helpful. I love levels and we're getting ready to use it and I got to hurry my butt up. Um, and then let's see, edit, transform. You want to know how to uh, transform things. So this is this will allow you to do specific transforms, but I like to go to free transform. And you'll notice how there's suddenly a little box around my, my uh, top piece of sandwich. And I can now rotate this, okay? And I can also scale it down. Now in Photoshop, don't scale larger than what it started at, okay? And that's why I say scan it in bigger because then you have that original big scan. And when you get into using smart objects, it's just beautiful because you've got this safe little giant version of your artwork and you're able to scale it up and down. And as long as you don't go larger than the original, then you have a very uh, high contrast, nice quality piece of artwork that you can scale. Okay, so it's all about how you bring it into Photoshop. And then if you do that, if you get a little process going for that, then you can definitely make giant artwork in Photoshop, okay? Um, so anyway, the underneath edit, you'll want to be able to transform things. Okay. And I like to use free transform. Okay. All right. So, uh, the tools I'm going to teach you as we go, because it's just a little bit easier to do that, but you do know that this arrow right here will move things around. Okay. And here's our swatches. If I click on this, it'll bring up the color picker. This is the hue cube, love it. Um, if you go to the left, it's going to uh, desaturate the color. If you go to the right, it's gonna saturate it. If you go up, it's going to lighten the color. If you go down, it's going to darken the color. You can also get, uh, you can get in there with the macros <laughs> and you know choose to only saturate by going from hue to saturation, clicking right here. And then you can also choose the brightness. Now, this is something you're gonna to need to know for Spoonflower. If you ever wanna to match to Spoonflower's colors, they have a Spoonflower color map that you can print on. I would recommend getting it printed on whatever uh, substrate you're gonna be using the most. Their petal uh, signature cotton is probably the most common. And you would get that Spoonflower color map printed on that petal signature cotton, get it sent to your house. Underneath those colors, there's little hex codes, okay? And what a hex code is, is it's like, it's almost like Pantone. It's giving you a very specific code of a color so that when you put that code into this color picker, it's gonna be the exact color that Spoonflower's printer prints on that fabric. So your best bet for color matching for Spoonflower is to get that map printed, come back to your file and say, ooh, I really like that red, and then find the hex code right here, hashtag, and then there's six numbers or letters. Make sure to put that hex code right here and then hit okay. 
and you will now have that color from the spoon flower color map put into your color picker, okay? So that's how you would match to the spoon, spoon flower color palette, okay? Now, uh, I'm gonna hit cancel. They also have a uh, spoon flower color map that you can download and you can see what I was talking about with hex codes. It might not look right on your screen, but Spoonflower has calibrated their printer to the palette that you see on that printed version of the map. So when you put the hex code into your screen, it might not look right, but it's gonna print right if you match it to their codes, okay? So you wanna look through here and you can just quickly get it if you download the digital version, version of the, the map. But getting it printed is the best way to match color. And it's just that way across the board in the industry, you're going to want to have things printed to look at because calibrating color is designer's nightmare. We all think it's a pain in the butt. It's never been easy. It's never right. So getting it printed, best way to do it, okay? Um, all right, let's see. Uh, doo -doo. All right, we're gonna do now a 15 minute demo. <laughs> Uh, and Abby, let me know if you're like, Sarah, you're going over, let's wrap this up. But I can, I can definitely get this part, um, you know, we'll be good to go. All right. So first, when you bring in, I, I, I scanned in uh, like really messy butterfly print with not good lighting because I want to show you how far you can take a scan like this, okay? So the reason why this scan looks so bad is because I want it that way, because I want to show you what you can do with Photoshop, all right? Um, it came in, like, all I did was I drug the scan onto the Photoshop icon. You can even go to File and Open, okay, right here. And the other thing, you know, there's obviously shortcuts, but if you go to Import Images from Device, this is where you'll find your scanner if you have a flatbed scanner. And um, you just set it up in your printers. You can get the scan to come in that way. Honestly, this one, I took a picture with my phone and brought it in, okay? That's why it has a wacky dimension. So I just was like, I'm just gonna scan it in with my phone and show them like, worst case scenario, you got a smartphone, snap a picture, and then you're good. Um, now you're not gonna have the freedom of what you can with a flatbed scanning it in for 600 or 900 DPI. Like you you are limited to what the phone can do, but it's a workaround if you don't have a scanner, okay? And if you're wondering what scanner should I get? The $100 Cano Scan Lide is perfect. You don't need the $2,000 Epson scanner unless you're like serious about scanning giant pieces of artwork. But I think the $100, you just need something that can scan in up to 1200 is a pretty good, just make sure it can scan that much resolution, okay? All right, so um, when I get into here, what I first do is I make a copy. So these are my layers. And if you just drag this down to this little plus sign, you can make a copy of that. And then I'm gonna click on the background layer and make a new layer underneath it or underneath the one above it, right? So I'm gonna hit that little plus sign. And when you hover over things in Photoshop, it kind of tells you what it does. So you're just gonna hit that little plus sign. And here is when I'm gonna use the paint bucket. So I'm gonna grab that paint bucket and I'm going to fill it in with a color that's not in the artwork so that I can make sure I can see that the background is being removed properly. And I'm gonna click on it, okay? So now this right here is, um, if I turn this off, you'll see the red, okay? Um, Y'all, let me go grab my cat because my cat is meowing at the door and I, it's gonna, I won't be able to focus, hold on. All right, uh, Jack is, uh, my students always see him. He sits right here behind me in this chair usually. Okay, so from here, we need to remove this background from the butterfly. And the best way to do that is to go up to image adjustments levels. Now the levels will change the value range in the artwork. Um, now, this is one specific demo, a very, very tight time frame. So there are, you can take beautiful watercolor paintings and change them 
in Photoshop, no problem. You can take the background out of all kinds of stuff. So, but this is just the simplest straightforward way. Um, first, I like to change the, I gotta get that paper to be super bright white. And then I need that black ink work to get darker. And then sometimes I'll adjust the midtones so that I can get that texture of the watercolor paper out of there a little bit. But you don't want the black of the artwork to get uh, eaten up by that. So you wanna be mindful about how much you do it, okay? Now I'm gonna hit okay. All right. Now my favorite tool for removing the background from artwork, there's a lot of them and I have lots of different techniques to do this for very subtle kind of edged artwork. But my favorite one for just black and white art is to uh, use the, let me see where it, which, underneath the eraser, it's the magic eraser tool. And these have gotten way better over the years. It used to not be as like clean, but it's really nice. Um, now, again, anytime you're touching a tool on the left side, you wanna make sure that you see what the options are up here. Tolerance will make it grab more of the background and contiguous means that it will select any pixels that are touching the color that's similar to the one that you click on, okay? So if you don't want it to um, take the white out of the middle of the butterflies, then you would click on contiguous. But if you want the white out of the middle of the butterflies, then you're gonna click on, um, you're gonna uncheck contiguous. Anti-aliasing up here just means, do you want the edges to be rough or smooth? It's more or less what it is. Um, so I always have anti-alias checks so that it makes you know the selection smoother. Um, now, before we remove this background, we got to get some of this cleaned up a little bit. Okay. Oops. I'm zooming in right now. I've got the space bar to pan. Sorry, my cat is like really loving on me right now. Um, and then we're moving around the canvas with the space bar. And I want you to grab the uh, this right here, the spot healing brush tool. This is a really quick way to get rid of blemishes. And if you hit the left and right bracket on your keyboard, this will allow you to move the brush up and down. But that spot healing brush tool, it's just gonna average the pixels around it to cover up the spot you're touching. So if you just wanna kind of quickly get rid of blemishes that you see, you can do that, okay? Bloop, 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 bloop. All right. And uh, now with the, the ink that's all around those edges, I can brush that out with a paintbrush. So if I grab a paintbrush and I just select, you know, any of my brushes, Photoshop comes with like, I would say, I wanna say thousands of brushes, but I know hundreds that Kyle Webster has designed and they're beautiful. And, um, but I would just pick a brush and like I said, top uh, the left and right bracket will make your brush larger or smaller. And you can, um, if you hold option, you can eyedropper that background and just paint right over the areas that, that you don't want anymore, right? Now I am using a tablet, but I know plenty of friends that use uh, the mouse in Photoshop and get really beautiful results. Um, this, these selection tools up here, like the lasso, if you want a little more control, like let's say you're using a mouse and you wanna be able to get right up next to the edges. When you make a selection in Photoshop, this is one of the biggest things that you need to keep in mind. Uh, marching ants. So. Right now, there's this tiny little sliver of a selection selected right here, right? And those marching ants are, that's saying, I am selecting this particular part of that layer that you're on right now, which means that if I go to paint on this whole canvas, the paint's only going to show up in that little bitty area, okay? So um, selections will allow you to get like more detailed selections within a layer that you're touching, okay? Um, now let's see, uh, in order to unselect something, you have to deselect it. So you'll come up to the select option in the, in the top bar and go to deselect, or you can go, uh, command D as in dog. Okay. Um, now what I would do is I would take this clone stamp right here. If, uh, I wanted to get rid of these blemishes and I would just brush away using the background as the, the thing that covers it up. So the way the clone stamp works is you hit option, 
Okay. And let's just do it over here so you can more clearly see what I'm selecting. Now, when my brush gets bigger, notice how I am getting ready to put this butterfly over here. So what the clone stamp does is it allows you to sample areas of the image and cover up other areas with it. So if I wanted to remove something from an, a photograph, or for example, let's take this bottom butterfly out. I'm going to hold option. And when I see that little target, I'm going to say, click this area. Oops, click that area. And I want you to cover up this butterfly. And notice how the crosshair is saying, look at what I'm selecting. Okay. So I'm just hitting option and clicking and grabbing a little area. And I'm able to completely remove something from my artwork. So your mind is probably like, oh my gosh. So that time I like dumped ink all over that piece, I could have fixed it. Yes. Yes. That's why we love it so much. I would say... I love Procreate so much, but when I think of why I like Photoshop more than Procreate, it's repeat patterns, selections, and the clone stamp tool. Um, now, there's obviously a bunch of other things like being able to really get specific on resizing documents and, and setting up like crop marks and stuff like that that are really, really useful. But uh, so... I'm gonna grab this polygonal lasso tool and get in here um, and clean this little area up of the butterfly. So I'm just kind of clicking along. And this one's awesome because if you have a mouse, it gives you more control over the selection. So I'm clicking along, okay. And now that I have that edge really nice and cleanly selected, now, Quick note, whenever you've got a lasso tool, you have to come back to where you started in order to close the selection. Once you see those marching ants, you're like, I did a good job. It's officially selected. Marching ants are like a Photoshop inside joke. We all know what they do. And it just means you've got a selection being made, right? Um, and you can only work within that selection. But that's awesome because if I wanna get right up to that butterfly edge, now I can select this little texture and get right up to that edge and cover that stuff up, okay? Now, Command D to deselect. So you can see how I'm starting to get this stuff out of here, the, the little blemishes. So now I'm gonna fast forward, pretend like I've got elevator music on for you, and I'm just gonna get these little blemishes out of here. But honestly, I'm gonna use the paintbrush to uh, do this because it'll go a little bit faster. Let me get a nice textury brush. Let's grab the gouache, the preem. All right. I like to clean the art before removing the background because it just makes it a little bit easier. Okay. All right. Now we gotta get this background out of here. So like I said, we have a layer underneath the butterfly so we can take the background out and not worry about, um, you know, the, we'll be able to see the background being removed more clearly. So we're gonna remove that background. Let's see. Um, see this eraser tool? Hold on to it for a second and you can find the magic eraser underneath it, okay? Now, if you try to do this to the background layer, it's not going to work. You got to do, you got to make a copy of the background by holding it and then dragging it down to this plus sign. Alternatively, you can right click and make a copy. And then in Photoshop fashion, there's another way to do it. And that's going up to layer. And then where is it? There's a duplicate layer up here. So they just put stuff in multiple areas for you to find. It's not like that much more information. Okay. Um, and then once you have this clicked, I've got contiguous click because I just want to pick the outside of the butterfly. Well, no, let's do, we're going to uncheck that. So now it will select all the white in the entire image. But if you've got like a watercolor piece with really subtle textures, you'll probably just want to click on contiguous so that it only selects the outside of the motif and it doesn't take the white out of that subtle gradient. Um, and then we have anti-alias check. So I'm just going to click on the background and it already did a pretty good job of taking that background out. And if it didn't do it all the way, you just keep clicking until it does it enough, right? Now, oops. 
there is a little white halo. And I'm going to go over this because this is one of the things that everybody's like, how do you get that to go away? So you might need to watch the replay for this, but just kind of follow along. Um, so if you hold command and click on the layer, it'll select everything that's on that layer. So right now the butterfly is being selected. Okay. Now I want to go right below, like I want it to select a little bit, oops, a little bit less than what it's selecting. I want it to come right into that white halo a little bit so that I can clean up those edges, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to select, modify, and then contract, because I want it to contract by like two pixels, okay? So right now it says contract selection, and I'm gonna pick two pixels. These lines are gonna go right down two pixels, okay? So watch the selection. Wow, okay. So now the white halo is right outside of my selection. So at this point, I just copy and paste this butterfly and it will remove the white halo. So go to edit, copy, edit, paste, okay? Now, if I go turn off the one underneath it, the halo is gone. And we're on a very limited time. So I there is ways, you might notice there's a little bit of a, you know, kind of a rough edge. There's ways to make selections that get that rough edge completely gone. Okay, so that kind of stuff is very fixable in Photoshop. Um, but what I am going to do is uh, do that one more time and select modify smooth. And I'm going to smooth it by one pixel. Then I'm going to select modify contract by uh, let's do two again all right and then copy and paste it make it a little bit smoother okay uh then i'm going to turn the artwork black and white so um you can go to image adjustments and then desaturate and then i'm going to make a copy of this butterfly and put it on top of itself a little bit just to kind of um darken it up okay all right, so we have this and um, I would probably go in here and just clean it up a little bit and get it looking really, really good. Get some of those edges to look more, a little more natural, okay? And if you, uh, if you grab your option tool or while you're using your brush, if you hold option, you're able to paint, okay? So if you ever need to go back in and redo something and you just want to find brushes that imitate your your art style and that's a that's a journey like you just kind of play around with them. I like to teach my students to have brush days so that they can kind of paint and um, play around without having to worry about you know all of that uh, like you don't want to find brushes while working on a deadline. You want to have like a small little selection of brushes that you really love, okay? Now, if you still find little pieces of white, you can always go to select uh, color range. And I'm going to select that white. And you can see up here, it's selecting all the white. Um, you can change the preview if you want to see a black mat. That'll show you what it's actually selecting. So whichever one works the best, and then you just hit OK, and then you can delete that, OK? But like I said, I would definitely, you know, spend some time really cleaning this up. Now, uh, Abby, I want to just double check. Do I have about 10 more minutes? Um, I think we might be able to go about five. Can we do five? Yeah. OK. OK. All right, so I'm going to make a new layer. And uh, that was just by hitting this plus sign. And what we're going to do from here is we're going to change the color of the uh, the butterfly. So grab your paint bucket, and I'm going to turn uh, the red layer just a different color because it's a little bit intense. Okay. So above the butterfly, I want you to just find a color that you really like and fill it in. Okay. And then hold the option key. If you hover between this layer and the butterfly, or alternatively, you can right click and then you can make a clipping mask. Okay. 
Once you have that clipping mask and the butterfly, you can change the color of the butterfly by filling it in with any color that you want. And what I would do is take these two and group them. Command G. Okay. All right. Now put a layer underneath the butterfly. And I want you to have fun with brushes and play around and paint. So right now I have my brush tool selected and you can paint underneath that, that line art to start to create something really, really pretty, okay? And I'm just using the Gouache Supreme brush. This is in the Kyle Brush Mega Pack, okay? And if you ever go outside the lines, you can always grab one of your uh, lasso tools and just delete it. And then my favorite thing to do is grab a texture file open recent. Right here. Oops. So this is a watercolor texture and I'm just going to drag the tab out and go throw it onto the butterfly and hit OK. All right. Now, once that's on there, we just learned how to make clipping masks. So now you can clip this texture to that yellow and right click, create a clipping mask. OK, so now that texture is on that yellow. And all you have to do from here is uh, play around with different blending modes. So have the texture selected and go through here. And that will allow you to play with lots of awesome like the texture possibilities in photoshop are endless but basically keep everything you make and then you can play around with it and really have fun with it okay all right so fast forward file open recent the butterfly demo <laughs> um let's see where did it go it's right here All right, I got wild with this design earlier today. But fast forward, playing around with art a lot, okay? Let's just say that we played around with that butterfly, made it look really cool. We took the wing and copied it and flipped it. Um, and I did that by going to edit, transform, flip horizontal. So I used the right side of the butterfly fly wing to make the left side. And here we are, we have the butterfly. Um, and what I want you to do is open, go to view, pattern preview, okay? And you might not be able to see it. Let's change the background color. All right, there is this, uh, this is our artboard. And what pattern preview will let you do is it'll let you build a repeat right into Photoshop. So you're gonna click on the butterfly, okay? So you're clicking on it. Now, I made it a smart object, and there's not enough time to go into what those do, but if you right-click on the image and go to convert to smart object, you can do that, but you really can just make the repeat out of the group. But what you want to do is you want to go to View and Pattern Preview, okay? And all you have to do is make copies of your artwork and literally build the repeat right in. I mean, the repeat part of this class was like three seconds. All you have to do is make copies of the motif, move it around until the pattern looks good. Like to me, this looks like a pretty nice lattice print made out of a butterfly. And I can change the background color by clicking on that layer. And I can, you know, do all kinds of different stuff at this point, change the background. And then when you go to export it for Spoonflower, all you have to do to keep it having the entire repeat tile in place is to export it while Pattern Preview is turned on, okay? So you're going to go to View, Pattern Preview, create a repeat, moving elements around, just making sure that you're touching the layer that you're actually needing to move around, build out the repeat, and then export from there. Okay. All right. I think that's my five minutes. 
<laughs> but we got there. We got to the repeat, and that was the key. And it's so beautiful. So I mean, uh, amazing, amazing. And the the feedback in the chat has been amazing, Sarah. Thank you for sharing all of these shortcuts. And I mean, honestly, everybody here, I think, learned at least five things, if not many, many more that we can use. So thank you so, so much. Um, and um, I know Jesse put a little link to a, um, a survey and um, we've got links to all of Sarah's classes um, that you can take as well. We did run out of time for Q&A, but I felt like it was more important that we got to the repeat part and we got to the end of the demo. So we will copy all of the questions that are in the Q&A and do our very best to answer them afterward, hopefully in a blog post on the Spoonflower blog as well. So thank you for your great questions. We do have them. We have saved them and we will get to them. So Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. And if you download, if you get on my newsletter and maybe I'll do an extended little session for y'all to finish up. All right. Thank you, Abby. That'd be awesome. All right, everybody. Take care. Thanks for coming to the symposium and see you at the next event. All right. Bye, everybody.